All right. Hey guys, what's up? <laughs> um, all right, so this this segment, this talk uh, is entering despair with a smile. But I want to give, uh, how do we enter despair with a smile? That's, that's kind of the discrepancy and that's kind of the ironic stance that not a lot of us enjoy um, uh, in, in, our, in our lives don't enjoy, um, we, we think to ourselves, uh, how is it possible that you can enjoy uh, despair uh, and melancholia? How, how, can we just, how can we enjoy melancholia, despair? Uh, what, what kind of utility, functionality um, is there to it? Because if we're being honest, uh, melancholia, and despair are real phenomenological experiences of our daily life. Um, and I, I will share with you guys how I sort of dealt with this uh, procedure uh, in, in life. Uh, you know, how I take really the most ironic stance, as some of you know, that are close to me, I always embrace the most ironic stances. But something that I've noticed in my own life is that melancholia or despair carries with it the most honest kind of statements. Um, you find this in the, you know, the, the, the man that He's been working all of his life for something um, filled with, you know, brimming with meaning and, and purpose. And then all of a sudden, because he never, he never gets there, he never achieves what he had desired, he concludes with a, um, a statement of, I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. I don't know uh what's i don't what's the point of all of this there is it's it's pointless it's um meaningless uh i define these statements as sort of like melancholic um they can also be despairing statements it kind of depends and yeah and even in the case of the the suicidal man, right? The, the suicidal man will, uh, you know, he'll say like, "There's no life is 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 there's no reason for living," basically, right? There's no good reason for me to live, so on and so on. Um, you know, the, the, for me, these are always honest statements. But they're not. Um, they're not realizations, if that makes any sense. They may. Uh, the, these statements are not realizations, and and I will explain to you why they're not realizations. Because if they were realizations, the melancholia and the despair wouldn't exist. Um. So how, how, how am I making sense of that? I'm, I'm making sense of that in the sense that let's do a, a philosophical experiment. Um, if you never began life with attributing some type of meaning, uh, some type of purpose, um, then you would have already reached the same conclusion as the melancholic guy. Right, you would have said, "Yes, there is no point to doing this work. This 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 work is meaningless." Um, and yet, because that's all I know, I continue to do so. Right. Um, whereas the the melancholic man that's saying this work is pointless, meaningless. There's no value. I don't understand why. Um, 
he has reached a, a, a similar conclusion, except his conclusion is predicated on the hope of finding something that is um, meaning, meaningful, uh, has, pur has purpose, um, isn't pointless, right? But, but for me, the, the melancholia uh, roots from the idea of wanting to go back to uh, the status quo of, of things when you had uh, w w when you had the uh, before you had the melancholia basically so to melancholia or despair uh, has the trap of you nostalgically wanting to you know find a life that has meaning purpose um, and it's all cozy and it's all beautiful um, and this is the nostalgia that erupts from uh, melancholia and despair. Um, but for me, the, these are the exact dangers of it. You know, Kierkegaard actually does, um, believe it or not, Kierkegaard, uh, in his spiritual writings, uh, he does this really ironic move here. And, and I've always enjoyed it. Um, he, he talks about how uh, when you're happy, um, this is like the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> uh, basically, um, because you're not going, because you, because you're going to fool yourself into thinking that you have something. This is what I love about Kierkegaard when he talks about happiness and despair, is that for Kierkegaard, happiness is is not it's not actually a good thing per se, because happiness fools the subject into thinking that they have something. Life is grand, life is good, I'm happy, so on. But what's ironic about leaning on a type of happiness is that within the reason for your happiness is the unreason for your unhappiness, right? It's, it's the very reason that also contributes to your unhappiness because if you don't have that reason, then you're not happy, right? So it's, it's funny how the same reasons that we construct to give our life meaning, purpose, um, courage, uh, is also the very same reasons that strip away those things. Life is now pointless. Life is now meaningless. My work is a void. I don't understand why I'm doing it. Um, all this other stuff, right? And then you're thrown into melancholia and despair. But this is where Kierkegaard gets really interesting because he actually says that when you are in this throne of, of unhappiness, despair, melancholia, um, for him, this is more of a, like you almost should be happy about this <laughs> for, for Kierkegaard. I'll have to reread the section. I'll have to find it again. But it was super fascinating to me because um, what, what Kierkegaard is saying is that in happiness, you didn't appreciate that you have nothing, basically, because you don't possess anything. Um, and then in despair and melancholia, you have nothing again. And so Kierkegaard is trying to make this point of the fact that actually in both states, melancholia and in happiness or despair, um, you never had anything to begin with. Um, and so this is the very interesting um, and ironic push that Kierkegaard does with melancholia, happiness, despair, um, and so on. Um, and so uh, why, why, why do I bring this up? What was the point of bringing this up? How, how, how can one enjoy melancholia? Well, the, the whole point of what I'm trying to say is that the enjoyment of melancholia is also a kind of happiness. But we've somehow stripped pain and pleasure in society as kind of one-sided, right? There's pain, should avoid pain. 
pleasure, it should be all pleasure, and so on and so on. But as usual, there is something pleasurable about pain. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is something pleasurable about pain. There is something pleasurable about suffering. And so what does it mean? What does it mean to have a, a pure enjoyment? A pure enjoyment, in my opinion, is something that is both painful and pleasurable, right? It is something that causes you pain and joy pleasure at the same time, right? It is in some sense, like maybe, you, the, you know, in like Lacanian sense is jouissance almost, right? Uh, except I'm, I'm really trying to stay away from Lacanian terms because, you know, I'm not the, the, the arena of expert in that. So uh, I rather just kind of spew my ideas. And then if you can connect to Lacanian topics and go ahead, if you feel comfortable. But um, my main point is that this enjoyment that I'm talking about, stripped of any Lacanian sense, um, but it may relate, who knows, um, is that it's supposed to be a kind of pain pleasure thing. It's a combination of the two. Actually, I would say the real enjoyment of life is when you can no longer distinguish between the two. When you can no longer distinguish between pain, pleasure, and so on. And this is why I say melancholia with a smile, because melancholia or despair with a smile is this kind of exact thing where you can no longer determine the difference between pain and pleasure anymore. And um, that's, in, in some sense, that's how I'm living my life. Um, because there's a lot of nuance to this idea in the sense that the, the dialectic between pain and pleasure, at least phen phenomenologically speaking, is how you continue enjoyment in life, honestly. It's how you continue to enjoy life. Right, you need pain so you can enjoy later. You need the enjoyment now so you can have pain later, so you can have enjoyment now, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. But most of us, uh, most at least in our society today, I'm not talking about you know my philosophical group or anything like that. Uh, most of us, in the sense that we uh, we want to you know split it. We want to split um, pain, uh, one side, pleasure, another side. Um, and what I'm saying is that you can't do that. Um, and so when we talk about life, we typically try to strip it uh, in this kind of uh, split, pain, pleasure. Um, and of course, pain, pleasure is also a kind of philosophy in itself, right? That you know, we uh, the goal is to attempt to avoid pain and aim, maximize pleasure, yada, yada, yada. It's such a utilitarian kind of thing, you know. Um, it's such an exchangist philosophy, um, which is probably the, the real problem underlying the, the pain and pleasure dichotomy. That's probably the real underlying issue. Um, not necessarily the dichotomy of pain and pleasure, but that kind of philosophy, that systems of exchange, where I'm going to do something that you, you see this in grind culture, right? I'm going to sacrifice myself, annihilate myself to have pleasure later. Um, but you see the, the trap of grind culture is that you're told to enjoy later. And so the demand is to enjoy later, right? And then when you finally have achieved your later, you take pictures of it. You show how successful you are. It's really the cap, the, the biggest capitalist portfolio that you can come up with at the end of your life. Um, look at what I've done. Look at all the success I've become. So on and so on and so on. Right? I sacrificed myself for this. I did so much hard work. Um, you know. And then yet, you get something immediately frustrating about that idea. That they are unhappy <laughs> that they've done all of this and have found a full and complete unhappiness <laughs> that what they annihilated themselves for what they sacrificed themselves for um 
finally got to that point. They, they got what they wanted. And now you're not happy, basically, right? Um, and so what does this mean? It means that we are assuming some type of exchange. We're assuming that if I, I can exchange my pain for pleasure, right? That I will take pain now and pleasure. Um, that's actually not what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I'm actually not provoking a kind of um, exchange philosophy, a philosophy of exchange to, to promote life as enjoyment. No, uh, life as enjoyment for me is that it's impossible to exchange. You cannot exchange. In fact, it's the one thing not offered, like the same, the, the same way I talk about love. It's the one thing that's not offered in life. Um, so it means that you are sacrificing yourself without any, any goals, any hope of any goals. And for me, that is the, the violence and the enjoyment of, of life and love. That life demands something of you, right? That you work, that you do something with your life, that you make decisions, um, and so on, right? We cannot escape this fact that you have to make decisions, you have to do things, um, you have to divide labor between you and your spouse, um, your kids. Um, you have to give up something. Right? You have to make a subtraction. You have to make a choice. Um, but it usually we usually uh, temper this with a promise of exchange that I will do this. I will be the best mother so that way my kids can be the best kids. Right. But you see how many times that has thrown that that idea has been thrown back into our face meaning that I find melancholic mothers, mothers in despair, because they realize that there is nothing you could have done almost from the beginning to have changed this um, outcome. That they start to realize that whether they were a good mother or a bad mother, they, they feel a, almost a helpless situation in the sense that their child would have came out the same. You know? And so we can debate all day about our actions you know only if i have done this my child would have been different uh it if i'm being honest maybe it, it's always a, a maybe a maybe but you know those statements are always post hoc it means that that life now will never happen it, it will never happen um and so it's always a, a sense of like well what do you do now right what do you do now? And this is why you can never predicate it on some type of exchange um, with your own life. This is what's funny about human beings. Uh, if I'm being honest, this is what's funny about human beings is that we promote this philosophy of being um, human beings of value, right? But we never associate the idea that human beings are priceless. Um, for some reason, we keep associating human beings come with a price. Like I have to do something and then I get something later, you know? And in that sense, humans are valuable to us. But we never uh, look at the pricelessness of being a human being. That actually, it doesn't matter what you offer, which priceless is the failure of being a human being that you could have never changed this possibly from the beginning. That the very things that gave you purpose, that gave you meaning, that gave you reason were the most technically melancholic and despairing statements about reality. What do I mean by this? It means that the very ground of your enjoyment is also the very ground of your melancholia. So for example, if you find enjoyment in the fact that you have meaning, if you have purpose, life is so filled with value um, and so on, it the, the meaning and the purpose is not the ground of being. 
No, it's it's actually quite the opposite. It's the fact that it's the ground of unmeaning, pointlessness, um, no hope that allows you to have those things in the first place. You know, like that's what's funny about hope. What's funny about hope is that you can't have hope without being hopeless first, right? You can't have reason without having some unreason first. You can't have meaning without some type of unmeaning first. Um, and so in this sense, I share with, um, I think Oji Rose would, uh, Daniel Gardner would uh, agree with me in the sense that um, it, there's this line that he says something about second things come first or, or whatever. Um, it, it has to do with a kind of ordering in life. Um, but this is also the, the funny thing too. We try to order our life, but in order to have order in life, life needs to be chaotic, no order, a disarray, unorganized. But you know, that's how you create things. You create meaning by rupturing forth from your uh, meaninglessness, from your hopelessness, from your lack of courage. Like, you know, in order to have courage, you have to be afraid. You have to be terrified. You have to feel so distraught. Um, and yet, uh, those are the very grounds uh, of your life. That, that, is what, that is what sets you up to be courage, to have courage, to, to find truth, to become someone. Um, and so, but you see, this is, this is the problem that I, that I have, is that we take these byproducts meaning, courage, hope, as the ground of our reality, which I disagree. Um, I disagree. I don't think it should be the ground of our reality. The enjoyment is found in that void. It is the void that allows you to enjoy. It is the void that allows you to make me to give points for things. But, but you know, this is also what's beautiful about creation and destruction is that because these layers of being are melancholic or despairing, right? There is no meaning. Uh, there's no value. Um, it's so funny because the very things that torture us, the very things that cause us harm, uh, rupture, um, they also have their unreason. Remember when I talked about this, that they have their unreason, that actually life doesn't have to be this way because there is no reason. There is no meaning. Life doesn't have to mean this way because it is meaningless, because there is no value. There is something valueless. Um, there is something priceless. You cannot... Um, and, then, and then yet the world, like I said, the world demands that you give a price, that you give a reason, that you give a kind of meaning. Um, but for me, this is the enjoyment of life, that I give a reason knowing that the real reason, the thing that gave birth to my reason, the thing that gave birth to my, my, um, my, my, my enjoyment for life and its value is the very fact that it has the most beautiful, melancholic ground, which is its unmeaning. It's the fact that it can be unbinded. That when I make a choice, I go, oh yeah, maybe that wasn't the best choice, right? Maybe that, maybe that, maybe I should not have given life that meaning. You know, maybe I should not have given value or attribute value in that kind of manner um, and so on. And so in my opinion, when we go back to states of melancholia and um, despair, uh, in my opinion, you have found your, your home. You, have, you are standing in a, your home ground, but it's so foreign to you, uh, at least phenomenologically speaking, that home is uncomfortable. 
Um, and I don't know if you guys can relate. I'm pretty sure a lot of us can relate. But that when we return home sometimes, it's not always warm. It's not always beautiful and cozy. Not everybody is anticipating your arrival. And not everybody is happy about your return. Um, and so even returning home can have a kind of honesty to it. Um, because when you realize that when you return home and that your you know, parents have some type of fixation about you doing something and your siblings have you know, some resentment about you or whatever, uh, you realize that this, this is the ground. This is, this is the ground of hope, actually. This is the ground of, of courage, that these are the situations that allow you for, for courage, for hope, for meaning, for value, because those are, in some sense, the most hopeless and uh, courage-avoiding situations, right? You start thinking to yourself, well, I can't change the family. I can't change how they perceive about me. I can't change, um, I can't change shit, really. Right. Um, but does that mean that you sort of diminish yourself, shrink yourself into such a small container um, that you decide to not do anything? No. Uh, you, you do something because you can't do it. That, 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 that's like my going to be like my phrase till, till I die, that you do something because you can't do it. Um, and for me, that's the enjoyment of life that you do something because you can't do it. Um, that I, I spend my life writing, thinking philosophy, doing whatever, um, talking about love, talking about bullshit with you and, and my imaginary audience. And the enjoyment I get from this is that I just can't do it. But I enjoy doing it, right? I enjoy hoping, having meaning, um, uh, courage, but it's fundamentally because I can't do it. <laughs> that's how I enjoy life, that I cannot do it, but that's why I do it. Um, and so uh, this is why you can do melancholia with a smile, because melancholia with a smile is this realization that you're living your life with this idea that the world demands something of you. And that you must give something. But at the end of the day, you cannot do it. <laughs> but you continue to try to do it. And that's where the enjoyment is found. That I continue to, in a very hopeless hope kind of way, remedy the family situation, right? Build up some type of structure for hope, meaning, and so on. And yet I know that I cannot do it, right? That probably at the end of the day, the situation will be the same. Um, but then sometimes you come across miracles where it does change, that the impossible becomes possible. And, and for me, I don't wanna make that the goal in life where the impossible becomes possible, but the enjoyment of life is that exact thing, in my opinion. It, it's the fact that I am fully committed, whatever my ideas are. I don't know what how my ideas will sh shape and shift in the future, but I feel like the position that I'm sort of uh, sharing with you guys now is probably a position that, um, probably one of the few ideas and positions that I probably will die with. Meaning that to have enjoyment for the impossible is this exact way of living that even when the impossible never happens it's because i'm committed to the impossible that i do it i don't i don't commit myself to the impossible with hopes that it becomes possible no i am committed to the impossible by being hopeless but i am in a hopeless hope i'm in a hope without hope um and for me that is the real enjoyment of life that blurs the lines between pain, pleasure, um, 
you know, uh, and, and you don't have to be, you know, I, I think looking at the way I'm setting this up, you don't have to be uh, philosophically minded, but you can uh, experiment this with yourself, the beauty of, of nothing, the beauty of the void of alienation. Um, you, you know, what's, what took me a long time to appreciate alienation is that I can do stuff like this. I can give you this talk in a void um, and somehow I can belong. In the midst of my alienation, I can belong. But I should never forget that belonging is the byproduct of alienation, not the goal of alienation. Alienation is alienation. It is just a sort of in itself. <laughs> but the enjoyment of life is that exact alienation that I am going for the impossible, that perhaps even thinking about belonging can be an impossible idea, yet as we strive for the impossible, we belong, right? It's not the content of what we belong to that matters. What, what denomination do I belong to? What philosophy group? You know, my Lacan bro, my Kierkegaard bro, Kierkegaard bros. <laughs> but um, you, you're not consumed by the content of what you belong to. Uh, and this is why I, I enjoy the concept of alienation, because alienation reminds you that you belong, but you belong without content. It means that you can belong to anything. You just have to choose, you know, you just have to choose what you belong to. But you need that alienation because when belonging fails, guess what? You can, you can belong again. And that's to me is, is the most beautiful idea that the, the melancholia of life and its underlying layers, right? The, the idea of no reason, meaninglessness, for me, it's like good good that there is no meaning, uh, no value, uh, no point in living. Good, good, because that means that when my reason for living fails, I can reason again. I can belong again. I can enjoy again. Um, it's almost like life offers you redemption by its empty contents. That's like, yeah, you know, you kind of fucked up this one. You know, you kind of fucked up this painting. But you know what? You can just take white and just paint it over, right? Paint it over, buddy. Um, and, and and you can and create something again. Uh, so maybe this is Nietzsche and I have no clue. Um, but yes, I, I think uh, that is uh, my my position uh, in, on life. And and. And I, and, I, I'm, and I don't want to downplay the, the real melancholic frustrations, but I think most of the time our emotions is, is mainly grappling with the failure. You know, that, that is probably the biggest impasse is, is when uh, our meanings fail and our values fail and our ideas fail, um, we don't know how to persist. But failure is, is a beautiful thing because it allows you to persist, basically, right? Like the fact that I never beat the game allows me to continue playing the game. Isn't that ironic, right? That we can never beat the game. Like you don't want to beat the game. You want to enjoy the game. And so if you want to think about life this way, that life is incomplete, that you don't want to complete life. You don't want life to complete you because that's how you continue enjoying life. And so when the, all those reasons fail, when all those hopes fail, that's, that's the enjoyment creeping in. That's life reminding you that, remember, you're supposed to enjoy life, not complete it. And 
it sounds so counterintuitive to the way we understand the world because we think, oh, yes, happiness will make me so happy, filled with completeness, and so will love, and so will everything is so nice and rosy and beautiful. And I'm like, no, you know, I just want pure violence. <laughs> I want the pure violence of living. Um, and because that is what makes love, love. That is what makes hope, hope. That utter violence of life that makes us continue to enjoy life. But um, if, but the thing is, if we undergird life with that little pebble of, you know, that it should complete me, then you you face the most despairing of all despairs. Um, that you you know you go for self annihilation basically. Um, but I what I'm trying to say is that there can be a self annihilation that is hopeful, you know, that in your hopelessness in your despair you say, you know, I fucked this one up, but I can do something about this. I can approach this in a different way. And maybe we can't change circumstances or conditions or people's minds or so on. But the one thing that you can always change, and this is where, you know, I hate self-help culture most of the time. But uh, in this case, uh, this one piece of advice is not bad, right? The fact that if you change your mode of being, life, despite its determined conditions can be still enjoyable, right? That even though we are conditioned by things, human beings also condition. This is something that Chetan brought up in the net with uh, Daniel Garner and I and all them, um, which was a very wonderful concept that I forgot about this, that human beings also condition things. So it means that in our melancholia, in our despair, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to once again redeem yourself and condition something. It's when the conditioning of something that you did in the past becomes your condition that melancholia and despair come again to greet us, to remind ourselves to once again condition something, create something, do something to do something in the void. I like the idea of doing something in the void because it means that I am making a pure choice. Um, the same thing with courage, that when I do something in the void, this is true courage. I'm not leaning on something, right? I'm not leaning on some type of epistemology of responsibility or, or structure. I'm not leaning on like the Christian faith or, or something like that. A uh, system of doctrines, uh, that's typically what I mean by that. I'm not leaning on that. I am in the void, making a stand, right? And it's so funny, because if you, if you just imagine a void, and you're taking a stand, it's like, you're like, why would you do that? It's just like, no point. What are you trying to get out of that? And And that's my exact point. You get nothing out of that. But that's also the most beautiful point is that you made a choice, um, but you made a real choice. You made a choice in the void. Um, and so now you are confronting real freedom. Now you're confronting real courage because you know, what's funny about courage is that most of the time we have to find something to be courageous about. Um, but you know, the way I see society progressing is that, I find less and less things, less and less reasons to be courageous, actually. Um, where I would say that you don't need a reason to be courageous, right? And that is the most, ironically, the most courageous thing that we can do. That I am, that in the midst of having no reason, um, no meaning, that I am courageous, that I make a choice, that I pick somewhere in the void and I say, that's going to be my idea. 
<laughs> that's going to be my life. And then when it fails, you do it again. Um, because that's also the enjoyment of life, the, the beauty of it. Um, and, you know, uh, I can say that this is relatively true <laughs> to, to, to my life. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty spot on to the way I have lived life. I'm not speaking uh, these kind of things in, in a vacuum. I've, 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 I've grappled with literally all of this, um, you know, in, 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 in real ways, in, in real serious ways. Um, and some of the most fundamental and enlightening experiences have been when I have been completely helpless, when I have been completely um, submitted to my own conditions, right, to the conditions that society brings uh, and so on, um, and, and, and it's alienation, you know. Um, and I remember, I think when I, because I started school recently, um, you know, I, I felt, I started feeling alienation like on a real bitter level, you know, that speaking in, in front of a classmate and, and school and stuff, um, I, I started noticing that I stand out like relatively easily because, you know, when I'm speaking, I'm saying all this crazy shit that I'm saying now. And people are like, you know, I can, I can understand, right? It's counterintuitive. It's not the social understanding. It's definitely not the contemporary understanding of life. It's, it's not popular culture understanding of life. And, and, and so you, you can feel alienated in this. And as much as it's, it's, you know, so easy to say it's a notable thing to do and it's, um, it feels courageous to do it. No, it's, it's, it's very frightening. I mean, you get to a certain point where you're like, I don't even know why I'm, I'm, I'm purposely, um, alienating myself actually. Like I, cause it, it started getting to a certain point where you start realizing that you start saying things and you realize that you are in some sense purposely alienating yourself. Um, mainly because you kind of know the, the, the reactions that you're going to get in some ways. Right. But then you, but then you see, I was, I was tied with this. I was like, well, you know, even though it feeds to my further alienation, um, I have to do it. I have to do it. Um, and this is when I started realizing that you cannot do alienation, perform alienation without, uh, you cannot think of, of trying to gain something with alienation. You know, alienation is because of that. It's, you get nothing. You get nothing in exchange for your alienation. That's the whole point. And so alienation is almost like the new sacrifice. And you sacrifice yourself not to gain anything. You gain, you sacrifice yourself because you love. That's it. Plain and simple. It is alienation, you can say, is the phenomenological experience of unrequited love. The other does not love you. And so why do you continue to love the other? Well, because I cannot help but do so. Right? This is alienation to me. And I've had many experiences of uh, unrequited love to back this up, right? Uh, and it's funny because I've been doing my series on, on dating. And... Um, Unrequited love doesn't teach you jack shit about dating, right? But it teaches you a lot about love. And, and so this is the epistemological discrepancy between love and dating, is that dating, people want to find love. To me, that's completely wrong. You just, the only thing about dating is that you learn how to date. Love is completely almost separate from that, but it includes dating, right? It, it includes dating, but doesn't belong to dating, right? This is the, the, the useful discretion in this. And, and this, I learned, I learned this because by being a single man, you are the, the, the epitome of failure for dating, but it gives you the perfect ground to understand what love is, ironically. 
Because then you understand that love is not any type of exchange. Love is not about satisfying your needs. Love, um, in its most maximal sense, is come as you are. Love in its minimum and its maximum in it is come as you are. And unrequited love is probably the biggest challenge to that. Meaning like you have to accept someone as they are in the midst of them denying you, hating you, spiting you, not enjoying you, doesn't love you. Um, yes, alienation uh, is the ground that you start to understand what love really means in this sense. And, and as I will say before, love is not reducible to its forms. It's not reducible to um, it just being friendship or it just being romance or it being just family. Um, but I do believe alienation in, in the most primordial sense of, of um, that the other doesn't want you and doesn't want what you have because you can't give it, <laughs> like the Lacanian sentiment. Um, this, that's how you understand love, in my opinion. You don't you don't gain like any content of love in some sense. You don't you don't you know in my own experience you don't still know how to like talk to women. You, you don't end up learning how to talk to women or how to deal with situations. No, no, you don't you don't learn anything about that. That is all relation dynamics, relationship dynamics, relationship ethics. That's all, you know, dating structure, dating rules, everything else. That that that's all that stuff. So how do, how do you know love in this sense? Lo knowing love is, is almost contentless. You don't have no content. The reason why I'd say it's contentless is because love allows you to see the other as other. But in order to see the other as other, it has to be contentless, right? Because if you start feeling love, filling love with some type of content, then you obscure the other. You think that your girlfriend should be this way and not another way. You tell her that you don't like her when she's wearing these clothes or whatever. Like this, to me, that's love predicated on some type of content, some type of idea. No, actually, the single man knows love best in some ways, if he can realize it, is when he says to himself, I have no idea what love is. Then you, you start to know love. <laughs> because when you say to yourself, I have no idea what love is, that's when love emerges, that the other can be seen as they are, that I have no idea what love is. But the, the other side of that problem is that we can't help but have an idea of what love is. And this is why love is always like a very common discourse. It's so populated with people's advice about love and what you should do. I'm very much against those ideas. They structuring about what you should do because again that goes into a type of ethics i'm against that because that assumes love has content you know to me love has no content love simply allows you i don't know what love is but it allows you to see the other as other so it has to be this pure subtraction love has to be this pure subtraction that you have to constantly work at doing that every time you say, no, you're not like this, you have to subtract that, 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 that. How do I see my, my wife, my girlfriend, my friends? How do I see them as them? It's through subtraction. You have to do a radical subtraction to see the other as other. Um, but because we can't help but have an idea about love, um, you work out this subtraction through tension and conflicts with the other. Meaning that the other also has an idea about love and how it should be conducted, how it should be framed. Um, and, and to me, this is how um, sublimation in your understanding about love occurs. That you start understanding that, okay, you and I both have an idea about love, but we both disagree right? Um, and so in the midst of this disagreement, this is love sort of working as its subtraction. It means that because we both have conflicts about our ideas of love, we have to go through a kind of sublimation. 
we have to construct together an idea of love that makes us see the other as other. And of course, you will never get an idea. This is the whole point of my talk uh, in some sense. You'll never get an idea of love that is conclusional. It's never conclusional. That's why I have to assume that love has no content. Love is without idea. That the most, the biggest understanding of love is the fact that I have no idea what love is. <laughs> but I must, because love demands so, I must give an idea. And so this is what's always going to be happening and working out with your phenomenological experience. And this is something that I've gone through a lot of times, um, you know, especially with unrequited love. You know, unrequited love is the biggest challenge to your own ideas of love, actually. You know, believe it or not, it's the biggest challenge because, you know, you think love should be conducted this way and then you find yourself alone. Right. Or or you, you find yourself that this person just doesn't love you. And so you're like, OK, so what what's the discrepancy here? And, and the same thing with couples and friendships. You, you know, you start thinking about an idea of love as a friendship and and you realize that it's tensioned with another idea of friendship and love. And so you start discovering that there is really no idea, but it demands an idea because in order for you to see the other as other, you have to, in some sense, propose, commit to an idea. Um, but I, I, I prefer the more uh, ironic proposal uh, the more ironic uh, commitment. Um, I'm committed to the idea of love without content. I'm permitted. I'm committed to the idea that love has no idea. Love has no idea because we already are in love. <laughs> um. Yeah, but okay. I think I think I've talked a lot. Uh, this is all the stuff that I've been wanting to talk about. Uh, recently uh, it's been on my mind um, so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed that talk if there's any questions i'll be happy to answer it you guys can dm me on instagram stuff all the stuff or leave messages here uh comments uh yeah i mean i love interacting with anyone everyone for the most part you know, for the most part it's a kind of enjoyment uh <laughs> but all right all right guys take care bye